I now have this. So I've deleted the hard-coded lecture 0 and hard-coded lecture 1. I now have a for each loop. I'm iterating over the array I've passed in with lectures as lecture. And then I'm dynamically outputting on each iteration the current lecture's ID using object notation. So this is not an associative array. It's an object, hence the arrow. And then over here, I'm escaping that lecture's name. So now I no longer have to ever touch my view or my model or my controller for that matter. <laughs> All I have to do is add rows to the database, which I could do sort of, uh, I could cheat and just use PHP my admin, or I could implement like an administrative interface that I type lecture numbers and names in to a form. So it's a good question. Um, so Code Igniter, one of Code Igniter's proclaimed features is that they don't have a template and uh, they don't have a template language because typically a template language does almost the same thing as you, it does at least as much as you well. It can be approximated with actual PHP. The danger in using PHP for a templating language, especially for large projects, is that you can execute arbitrary PHP code, even though it's only supposed to do things aesthetically, like spit out an ordered list or text or the like. So often in, lar in companies or in projects where you have maybe uh, third-party developers or contractors who you want them to do the HTML work and you want them to do the design work, but you want your people who actually are tr more trustworthy to have access to the database and raw PHP code, Code, then you would use a templating engine like Smarty is a very popular one, and that is purely aesthetic. Um, and that's a little white lie. You can also execute arbitrary code, but you can disable it. So in short, CodeIgniter is nice in that you don't have to learn some arbitrary template library, but those do have value, especially for performance if you can start caching them. Um, and there's, again, client-side versions. So what's the M? Well, the last directory in here that's new is models. And notice that there are two files. These are almost identical. And these, frankly, are some of the nuisances, I think, of CodeIgniter, where the class is called lecture, but they make you uh, write the file name in lowercase. But this is not an uncommon PHP uh, paradigm. So in lecture is now a class that does not extend CI controller. It extends CI model. And all this does is it implements a method called get lectures, and it uses CodeIgniter's uh, syntax for executing a SQL query. So give me this CodeIgniter instances database object and select both ID and name from the table called lectures and order it by ID in ascending order. And then this last query here executes, um, it gets the results and then returns all of them as an array. And for those unfamiliar with CodeIgniter, frankly, CodeIgniter's uh, database library does not add all that much. This is essentially comparable if you recall to MySQL query, select ID name from lectures order by ID ascending, and then doing uh, the equivalent of while uh, row gets MySQL fetch associ, my oh, actually fetch object of result. We'll do this lectures gets array, lectures gets row, return lectures. So if this looks unfamiliar, all CodeIgniter is doing is simplifying what in CS50 or similar you might have done a little more manually. Um, and so you can refer to the online documentation for their library that simplifies that. What's that? It can. So that is one of the upsides of using CodeIgniter's library. Um, but there are, <coughs> it is using something called PDO, which we'll glance at briefly today or next time. Um, but that is among the features. You don't have to call MySQL real escape string anymore if you use a number of these abstraction libraries. Yeah? Are we allowed to extend something like a doctrine record instead of CI model? If we, can we use doctrine? Basically? Yeah, if you really want. Sure. You can use other libraries if you think it lends itself to a better design. Sure. Other questions? All right, so where did the database connection come from? Just to close this loop. So when in doubt, check out the config. And in config, there's a lot of files, most of which we don't care about for now. But if I go into database, notice that most of this is comments, but I did have to fill in a few blanks. And you might have done this last week for lab one when you played around with CodeIgniter then. And the last thing I had to do was this. So CodeIgniter, for performance reasons, lets you specify in its configuration what libraries do you want to load in advance so that you don't have to require once this file, this file, this file, this file, which is going to result in their being interpreted, compiled, and not used potentially. So with this line here, autoload, I'm saying I want to use a database for this particular application. Make sure that this arrow db 
is accessible to me. So when diving into Project Zero, don't get distracted as best you can by this sort of code igniter specific stuff that's not all that intellectually interesting. <laughs> Much more interesting to take away from this thus far is the fact that you have these models in one directory, controllers in another, views in another, and how they intercommunicate by way of method calls from one to the other. That's the interesting idea. Any questions? All right, let's take a five minute break. All right. So to um, everyone's awake now, but to help maintain that state, we've propped open some windows with erasers. So hopefully that will help here. And I'll get more interesting. All right. So now we get to have more fun design discussions, hopefully, specifically in the context of databases. So we spent some time reviewing the design docs and style guides that have come in over the past couple of days. Um, do realize that you're welcome to forge ahead now with your partner. Um, the, your uh, teaching fellow will be assigned later today. So you'll get an email specifying who your teaching fellow will be. If you have very pressing concerns, you're welcome at that point to email him or her to find out some answers. But we'll also get back to you over the next day or two with any glaring deficiencies that we felt might exist in your design. But no, do not feel obliged to wait on us. So um, databases. So this is something you'll likely make use of for this project or for some future project, whether it's in the form of a MySQL database, which is probably going to prove to be the common case. Totally fine, very reasonable. Um, you might end up choosing, in the context of iOS later on in the semester, uh, SQLite, which allows you to store an entire SQL database in a single binary file on disk, or in the case of iOS, on the iOS device itself. But you can still execute queries on it, even though it's not a server that's actually running. It's just a binary <laughs> file. But all of these databases, whether in uh, MySQL form or SQLite form, are relational in nature. And what does this mean? Well, it means that you can think of them, frankly, like Excel spreadsheets with, table, with uh, tables that have rows and columns. And you might have multiple worksheets or multiple columns. Now, we, do use, we interface with these tables either via something like PHP MyAdmin, which is nice because it's just user friendly and it simplifies the process. But you can also use, as you saw before, the command line. And we'll use the command line in a little bit to establish two separate connections to a database and see what can go wrong if we simulate two different users trying to, say, withdraw money from a bank account from two different ATMs um, without implementing the database checks properly, as we shall see. So consider this example. So thus far, you're probably familiar with SQL and selecting data, inserting, update, and the like. But let's make sure everyone's on the same page with regard to more sophisticated queries. Still pretty simple, though, using what are called joins. And these can either be implicit or explicit. So for the sake of discussion, assume that some database has two tables at the moment. There is an employees table, which has an employee ID column and a name column, the first of which is numeric, the last of which is uh, strings. And then we have an orders column, which has a product ID, a product name, and an employee ID. And the employee ID signifies who sold that product uh, to some customer. So just looking at these two tables, does anything rub you wrong about the design of this? And this is actually taken from a website called W3Schools, which has plenty of things wrong with it. So <laughs> here's one of them. What's bad about the design? Ignore the query. We'll get there. What's bad? Just one employee can sell a certain product. Okay, so well at the moment. Okay, so this imply this is think of this as a this is orders. So who sold that product? Well, if two people, if two employees sold a chair, that's not reflected in that. Okay, so if you have two people tag teaming, maybe you have a trainee and the senior salesman. Okay, so we can't model that because we have to give credit to one person. That might be reasonable, but but fair. Yeah. OK, good. So if the customer comes in and buys quantity 30, we're going to have 30 rows when, frankly, we could probably get away with one with an additional field like quantity. What else? Yeah. There should probably be a products table that matches product ID to the product rather than just putting both of those in, in the orders table. Yeah, this is what rubs me the, 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 the wrong way the most. So these tables are not in uh, what we call 3NF or third normal form. And this is just a fancy way of saying there is unnecessary, there's the potential for unnecessary redundancy in at least one of these tables. And by redundancy, we mean exactly this. Notice that you've got printer, table, and chair. And each of those is apparently uniquely identified by a product ID. And yet the implication of this orders table here on the right-hand side is that if we sell another chair, another printer, 
here, another table, not only is the product ID going to end up as in another row of that table, and that's OK, but so is the name again and again and again and again. And that's just not necessary. There's an easy opportunity here to have, as you proposed, a products table. And what field should probably be in that products table? Yeah. Exactly. Simple as that. So product ID and product name. Now the problem, of course, is that if you factor out product name from that table, but you want to execute queries in the future that give you back the person's name or employee ID, the product name, and the product number, it feels like you're going to have to select from this table, select from this table, select from this table. So we've gone from one SQL query to three. For instance, well, you can, and that seems to suggest that we slowed things down just to be anal about keeping everything nice and neat. But the reality is, this is how relational databases are meant to be used, and they allow you to join tables again so as to create temporary tables in memory that contain precisely the information that you want. So here's a simple example that doesn't even use yet the keyword join. If I want to select employee, an employee's name and the product name, Uh, from these tables, I can do this syntax here. Select employees.name, comma, orders.product. So you just very explicitly mention not just the field name, but the table from which it comes. That's not strictly necessary. You can get away with just saying the field name if it doesn't exist in both places. Otherwise, it's ambiguous, but better stylistically, perhaps, to be ever so readable like this. From employees, comma, order. So you put a comma separated list of the tables from which you want to pull this data, where employees ID equals employees ID in each of the tables. So in other words, this is implying that you should take this table here with employee ID. And this table here, and if you can imagine in your mind taking one table, moving them around on the screen, and overlaying them in such a way that the employee IDs line up, what do you get? You get a slightly wider table that contains the information you care about, or specifically all you're asking for back is name and product. So the table you get back is going to look like this. So all this while, if you've been using SQL before, CS50 Finance or the like, or this current project last week, what you're doing when you select is getting back result sets, but you can really think of those as temporary tables in memory. And so in this case, now we can iterate over this as with MySQL Fetch a SOS or with CodeIgniter's equivalent, and we can print out that Ola sold this, and Steven sold this, and Steven also sold this. So what's the point here? Well, this is a very simple example. But certainly, this model here is not going to scale very well. You're just going to be spending a ridiculous number of bytes for large data sets redundantly. Moreover, what's a future performance implication if you store table, 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 as well as its number, 657, all over the place? Yeah. Yeah, something simple, right? Like you just want to change the name. Now you have to do an update on this entire table, have the, change all these rows, which is going to trigger a re-indexing of that table potentially, which itself is going to be slow. So in short, there's just no reason to do this. So the goal of any table design, certainly for Project Zero, is to ask yourself, is there any redundancy here? And can I factor something out? Another canonical example is zip codes. If you are storing an address book of people, you've got a name, first name, last name, phone number, city, state, zip. Well, which of those should actually be filtered out from that, factored out from that table? Yeah, so city state, right? It might feel very natural to just have every row in the table have a user's entire address, but do I really need Cambridge, comma, mass for 02138, 02138, all over the place? Rather, I can probably use 02138 as a key, store only that in my address book table, <laughs> and then have a zip codes table that maps zip code to city state. Now, that's a bit of an overstatement because the US has made a mess of the postal codes, and so there are actually multiple city names sometimes for given zip codes. Um, but that's sort of an uh, uh, orthogonal problem. But the idea of factoring it out is at least uh, a good takeaway here. So let's be more explicit as to what we're actually joining here. So before, now, after. So the syntax is slightly different, but it allows you now to express with the SQL join, uh, join keyword exactly what you want to do. So let's select name and product from the employees table joined on orders. So the fact that I've written this on three lines, totally arbitrary. It's just for formatting's sake. So the table I'm selecting from now is employees join orders. But what do you mean join uh, on those two tables? You have to specify. Join on employees.employeeID, 
such that it equals orders.employee ID. So, in other words, take these two tables and line them up in such a way that the employee IDs line up on both sides. Now, as an aside, there's other types of joins that might very well be relevant to even Project Zero or future projects. There's left joins, there's right joins, there's full joins, inner, outer joins. So, this is an example. Um, of, this is the default join scenario. But suppose that one of these tables had, um, suppose there was employee number five, like Dave, Malin, David, and he hadn't sold anything. Well, when you join two tables like this, they're only going to join rows that match 